There we go. All right. So if you get lost or fall asleep today or you're watching remotely, um, the slides are all up here. If you go to this web page, there are a couple things up there that are going to get taken out today. So give me a couple of hours to clean it up. But all the slides are up. All right, so I want to talk to you today about work that my lab has been doing for the last couple of years. I'll do a very brief run through sort of what I did as a postdoc and then get on to kind of what we've been doing. Uh, one study is published, a couple are unpublished, and sort of talk to you about where we're headed in the future. All right, so I spent a lot of my time in Michael Platt's lab uh, working with these guys. These are rhesus monkeys, and we spent a lot of time in the lab thinking about animal behavior. So as any good ethologist will tell you, there are four sort of basic principal axes to animal behavior. They go by the four Fs. This is fighting, fleeing, foraging, and reproduction. And we spent a lot of time thinking about how to study these things, which are very complex, non-repeatable behaviors um, in very non-complex, highly repeatable laboratory settings. So I did a bunch of work in Michael's lab uh, focusing on these sort of classic topics in neuroeconomics, like the explore-exploit trade-off and temporal discounting. Um, looking at learning under uncertainty, um, learning in a foraging context, and in the last couple of years, some things having to do with social reward. Things that a lot of people here know a lot about. But the thing that I started worrying about a lot in Michael's lab toward the end and really kind of moved me in the direction that I've taken in the last few years is really thinking about how you take something like this, which is a complex social behavior like grooming. Right? This is the glue of macaque societies, is if I groom you and you groom me, there's some reciprocity expectations, and they help to form the kind of social structure and social network, and how we take a complicated phenomenon like this and we turn it into something like this. So people here are very familiar. You know, this is the sort of standard uh, statistical parametric map from functional MRI, or you can have the parastimulus time histogram from electrophysiology, and these are sort of the traditional ways we think about results in systems neuroscience. This is how we package our data so that it makes sense to other people in the field. But unfortunately, something like this does not lend itself very well into something, turning it into something like this. And the reasons for that are something that I'll call for purposes of the talk. It's debatable about whether this constitutes exactly what this is, but this tuning curve paradigm. So what I'm going to mean by that for purposes of this talk is the following. This is a paradigm that really grows out of you know, completely groundbreaking work, Nobel Prize winning work in systems neuroscience now many decades ago, where we set our, we set our experiments up like this. A subject is going to repeat a behavior many, many times. Um, we are going to record a single unit or a collection of single neurons. Um, we're going to average the firing rates of those neurons across repeats of that behavior that's as identical as we can make it. And we're going to characterize populations of neurons by their tuning curves. And the tuning is to whatever set of variables we care about. So in the classic experiments, there's some orientation of a stimulus, and the neuron fires more strongly to some orientations than others. And so we really care about how neurons care about orientation or contrast, or if you're in the decision world, how they care about risk or uncertainty. And that is the characterization of the population that we're looking to do. Now, the really difficult thing about this is after now, you know, 15-ish years or so of decision neuroscience, I think, at least I'll give you my take on it, is that this has not worked especially well in the front half of the brain. That as people have expanded the number of variables that they're interested in looking at, Almost all cells are tuned a little bit to almost all variables. There's high, high overlap and not a lot of specificity. So it's a very different story than the one that's been so successful in sensory and motor cortex. Um, so we have these complex behaviors that we're interested in that are never quite repeated. We're never quite looking at the same social behavior from trial one to trial two. And in fact, there's some social dynamic in the case of our macaques who are housed together um, that is happening outside the course of the experiment that people would like to know about dominance relationships, who are cage mates, um, you know, who's got a long repeat of the serotonin gene, the serotonin transporter gene. Um, so the dynamics are not quite regular enough for us to average. So the average across trials is maybe not a good synopsis of what the system is doing, and there just aren't obvious tuning curves. You can find them if you look really, really hard, but it doesn't smack you in the face like it does when you look at other systems in the brain. And while I was doing all this, I think most people here are aware of this happened. I mean, this book is from 2015. But the kinds of breakthroughs that have been happening in the computer science and statistics and machine learning world um, for really the last decade have been dramatic. Um, you know, computers are now our best Go players. Um, they do really, depending on your language, passable to good machine translation from one language to another. Um, they do lots of things really well, and yet very few of these tools were we using to analyze the data coming out of our experiments. So let me make a case for why this is useful. 
Um, neuroscience has a long tradition of very principled models, either normative models for behavior or how you should solve the vision problem or how you should do motor control. Um, and one of the hallmarks of these machine learning methods is that in some ways they're very hypothesis free. And that can be a bad thing, but it can also be a good thing. So my argument to you is that I can make a model and my model actually fits the data. I spent a lot of my time uh, doing decision neuroscience, fitting models with two and three parameters where the parameters were statistically significant. They accounted for some percentage of the variance in the data, and that percentage of the variance was very, very low. And if I, in fact, generated novel behavior from those models, the novel behavior would not look like real behavior at all. There are really important axes of complex behavior that we were failing to capture because we were trying to get it with models that had a very small number of parameters. Um, it allows us to have a very robust toolbox for checking whether the models that we fit actually are fits or whether they just look okay. Um, and something I'll talk about today and kind of give some examples of what I mean by is these sort of structured black box models. So I as a scientist may actually have fairly strong hypotheses about what's going on in a system, but my hypotheses may say, oh, and then there's some nonlinear transform here. And it may be totally irrelevant to my science whether that transform is an exponential or a power law or something else, and I just want to fit it. And so these structured black box models are a way of saying, well, there are pieces that I don't care about. Those will be fit as black boxes. And the pieces that my science informs, I'll make principal mathematical models of. So we're trying to marry the best of both worlds. The other thing that I think is, has been sort of underexplored, or let's say was explored a lot in the 90s and not as much in the last decade, is thinking of artificial neural networks as model systems, right? We all know that we study model systems if we're not working in humans, and we study them because we think they have these homologies to real examples in the human brain. But of course, those models we know are not perfect, and we make trade-offs because certain kinds of experiments become tractable. Well, I think at the level of the algorithms used in computation, artificial neural networks have really interesting potential homologies. Nobody thinks that the modern neural networks that they're building now are the way the brain is working. People will try to argue this, but I think they're very preliminary arguments. On the other hand, if you really care about how to build a system that does reinforcement learning as efficiently as humans do, you might want to look at the algorithms people are using right now to try to figure out how to use reinforcement learning to play, reinforcement learning to play video games, to train robots after single demonstrations. This is kind of the frontier in machine learning right now, is how to do reinforcement learning in as sample efficient a way as humans do. So I think the other thing that's really interesting, and this is a classic principle of sort of modeling and physics and other things, is what details can I get rid of and the system still work? Not every synapse in the brain has to be positioned at exactly the right position for your brain to continue to function. And yet, we study the nervous system at all these levels of behavior, never quite knowing for any given behavior what details are safe to ignore. And I think the last thing here is also, you know, been very fashionable at various points in the history of neuroscience, but is, is due to come back in again, is to take seriously the idea that computation in the brain is distributed and asynchronous and parallel. That there is not a one-stage model where you do a computation in this area and then everything moves in lockstep to the next node in the network. It's all happening at the same time. And these networks give us a chance to at least look at some kind of system that solves a meaningful task where we know what all the pieces are. So not perfect, but informative. All right, so what my lab does is look at some very high-level behaviors like foraging and complex social behavior. Um, we take a very data-driven approach. I don't have a lot of fixed ideas about how the brain works, but there is a lot of fantastic data coming in, and I think it's a real opportunity for the next decade to sort of inform the kind of theorizing we do by looking at what actually happens. Um, and we have a particular interest, as a lot of other people do, in sort of whole brain dynamics. All right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, really these first two things. So uh, there are links if you go to the web page. So this uh, was published last fall, and this is up on archive. We presented it at a workshop at NIPS. Um, and I'll talk about some preliminary things at the very end. So three studies today, but really principally two. So the first one starts with this question that um, is really inspired by this book by uh, Dorothy Cheney and Robert <coughs> Seifert called How Do Monkeys See the World? And we have this long tradition of asking how single neurons in the brain see the world. So this is a classic sort of Gabor patch. So it has a spatial frequency. It has a contrast alteration. It has a tilt angle. So this is the sort of stimulus you might show. Uh, to a macaque or to a rat or to whatever your model system happens to be to characterize a cell, you know, a simple cell in V1 or a complex cell. This is a much more complex stimulus set and it's hard to see probably at this distance, but these faces are all subtly different from each other in terms of how far apart the eyes are and the eyebrow tilt. So these are the sort of stimuli used by Dorsau and Vernick Freiwald and various other people to look at single units in face patches in macaque 
uh, temporal lobe because those cells are very exquisitely tuned to things like how far apart the eyes are. What's important in both of these cases is there is a stimulus space that is reasonably well understood. We have a sense of what the variables are that cells in V1 are tuned to. We have a sense of what the stimuli are that cells in these face patches are tuned to. But what we started with in Michael's lab was what you do with a stimulus that looks like this. And then maybe I hope will load. All right, let's get it to reload. So what if we use this? And now it's reloading for real. What you don't see is it's playing on my monitor, but not yours. Um, I'm just going to do this and shoot for this. OK. So this is a video that's taken on Cayo Santiago, which before the hurricane was a field site with about 1,000 rhesus monkeys. And these guys are taking part in a very complex interaction. The dots that you're seeing are eye gaze from a couple of different monkeys over the course of many, many repeat sessions. What I want you to notice here is the following. One, there's a lot of clustering in these dots. Even the 50th time the monkey sees this video clip, the same sets of things he finds interesting. Um, those, by the way, happen to be things like faces of aggressors and genitals. Um, the other thing that's really important is that there is no intrinsic feature space here. You can try to come up with one, and Jeff Adams, who is a grad student in the lab, spent a lot of time like, very carefully setting out an ethogram for this task. Um, but the reality of the matter is we don't know if we have the right variables. And so we set out over the course of an So an ethogram is a list uh, that a field biologist would use of sort of all the behaviors that might be of interest. So things like grooming, how many animals are in the scene, are they eating, are they doing other things. So all the things that if you go to the anthropology department, they'll tell you are the kinds of variables you should pay attention to if you're a primatologist. So let me get my mouth back up. All right. All right, so this is work with Shin Chen, who was uh, an RA in my lab as a postdoc, and uh, Jeff Beck, who's a colleague of mine at Duke. So the idea here is we're going to run an experiment. And this is a little bit complicated, and there's some extra notation. But in principle, it's very, very simple. So I'm going to put movies aside for a second. Everything I'm talking about today works with movies, but I'm going to talk about still images. So the idea is that we have some set of stimuli up here. So these are going to be based on data from David Leopold's lab. Um, so there are monkey close-up faces. There are whole monkeys. There are um, you know, natural objects. There are man-made objects in a couple of other categories. And the idea is that I have some big index of all my stimuli in the experiment. And every day I go in, and I'm going to show these stimuli in some you know, randomized order. And I'm going to record a bunch of cells. Tomorrow they may be different cells. They may be the same cells. There may be overlap. I may have cells go in and out. So we're capable of handling all the sort of complexities that come with that. But basically, you're just presenting an image and then a blank screen, and you're looking at the spiking response from the neurons. All right, so I'm going to make a model. Um, the math is unavoidable here, but I'm going to try to walk you through it. So the idea is that my data look like this matrix that is essentially um, one row for every neuron in my experiment and one bin for every time. And time here is um, my stimulus. So we're going to pretend all my stimuli are in kind of one movie right after the other. That fiction kind of lets everything work. And I'm going to have some count data. How many spikes were fired in a particular time bin to a particular stimulus? And what I'm going to do is take this matrix N, and I'm going to factorize it. So I'm going to say it is the product of this really tall, skinny matrix um, and this really wide, uh, you know, thin matrix. So these guys are sort of my responses. Every neuron is going to have a set of responses to every stimulus category. And I've not told you what those are yet, but there are K of them. There are K features. So this thing is skinny, and this thing is skinny, because there's some number K that I don't know, and it's the number of features out there in the world. This Z is what it, what's important. This is a binary matrix, and it says, as time goes on, oh, feature 5 here was present for these two bins, and then it was off. And feature 4 was present, and then it went off, and it was present, and it went off, and it came back on again. So what we're really doing is saying, if I played you a movie of the world, and I could tag it the same way that Google just tags images with categories. Oh, there's a monkey in it. There's an aggressive instance in it. There is some grooming. Somebody's eating. We don't know what the tags are. We just assume they're yes, no. And that what we can do is account for this neural firing by essentially saying that there are, I don't know, 5 or 10 or 15 of these tags. Every frame of the movie either has them or doesn't. And by multiplying the responses of neurons to these tags that nobody gives us, by whether the tag is present or not, we can account for firing. 
So that's the model, that there are some set of variables out there in the world that neurons care about, and we don't know what they are, and so we're going to infer them. Um, does it matter uh, if you think about this in the real uh, terminal data space, yep. if, if it's foveated information? So, so in a scene, right. you know, the, the monkey's looking at the face of the genitals and the interface coming in, but presumably there are other neurons around. What they're analyzing is more peripheral in the scene. Right. Are those parts? They're not. So we're not dealing with the level of granularity. We're only tagging the stimulus. Now, what we can do, and I'll just blow through this really quickly, is if you have another regressor of interest, like where on the screen things are foveated, and you as an experimentalist know that, then you can build those into this model, the same way you would do in a normal regression model that you use to analyze data. So we will allow you to build in things that you think should matter. So if um, motion energy is something that you're in an area that you think really cares about, you can build that in, and we'll find a regression coefficient for that, too. So the foveation is tricky. <coughs> the eye tracking data, it's a longer term goal to sort of build the eye tracking data into this. They're small enough in practice that you're getting good coverage even of what's not in the fovea. Um, and periphery is pretty good for distinguishing some of these social categories too. Um, so we're not the first to do this. There are a lot of labs that have kind of been interested in this question but from slightly different angles. So a lot of you know um, Jack Gallant's work where they're looking at doing prediction from movies. That's a classification task. We're doing a data discovery sort of approach. Um, there are people who do these continuous latent state models. This is a lot of work. Um, uh, Meming Park and Liam Paninsky's group have done a lot of this. And there's some, even some people who have done sort of discrete latent states the way we're doing. So what are we doing that's actually different? The key thing is that most people have been really interested in, a, in internal dynamics. So what are the states that explain why firing is different from one presentation of the same stimulus to the next? I'm interested in the opposite thing. I'm trying to get at what is consistent from, this, from one presentation of the same stimulus to the next. I only want to identify features out in the world that drive variability in neural firing. So I'm averaging over some things here. You may be thinking about a car when I show you a picture of a car, but you may be thinking about the vacation you're going to take. I'm not capturing that variability. I'm just asking what is consistent every time I show you a picture of a car. So that's our unique thing. We also have these sort of combinatorial combination of states. So I'm, I'm allowed to put multiple labels on every frame. Every frame isn't just tagged with one thing. All right, so the way this works in practice is that we have some matrix of firing rates for every time and every neuron. And we have some set of variability across trials. It's a nuisance parameter in the model. And then what I'm going to do is say that my firing rates are built up in this way. So for some of you that are aficionados of the model, if you want to log this and assume it's a linear model, that's totally fine. Um, I'm doing it with multiplication because it makes the math work out so the model runs fast. There are just some tricks that we use. So basically, you're going to start out with a baseline firing rate, and all these other things are gain changes. So you say, oh, tag 1 is present. That's a 5% positive gain change for this neuron. And tag 2 is absent, so the neuron is going to go down below baseline by 15%. So you should think of all these as being percentage adjustments on the baseline firing rate of the neuron based on these Zs, which is, are the features present there or not? And then this piece is essentially the, the regressors I know, things that I as the experimenter control. So it is basically a big regression model. It's just that we are jointly inferring these firing responses and these latent variables at the same time. All right. So the thing is, we have some model, that model that I just showed you, that says if you give me these latent variables and you give me all the parameters, I'm going to generate count data for you. I could generate fake data from my model once it's trained. And they should look like the real data. Um, unfortunately, what we want is we want to infer these latent variables given the data. So this is you know, Bayes' rule. Um, I can take my likelihood and my priors. And if it were just as simple as multiplying them, I could get this thing and I'd be done. So I essentially want to say I'm given data. And what's the probability my latent features given data? Those of you who've done any of this know that doing this exactly is like an NP hard problem. I can't do it exactly. Nobody's going to write down a closed form solution to this, so we need an approximate way of doing it. All right, so Dave Bly is a, a machine learning guy at Columbia, and he sort of asked this question at NIPS a couple of years ago. Do you want the wrong answer to the right problem or the right answer to the wrong question? He says, I think you want the former. So I'm going to give you the former today. Um, I'm going to tell you that um, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm not going to do exact Bayesian inference, but I am going to do inexact Bayesian inference that you can do and do quickly. So the trick is this so-called variational Bayesian approach. And that is, what I'm going to say is, there's some posterior distribution. There's some fitted model that I would like to have. I can't get that. So what I'm going to do is have a big model with a bunch of parameters, 
And what I'm going to do is adjust some kind of metric and try to make the true posterior as close as I can to my approximate posterior by turning the knobs on those parameters. So the typical metric that you use is this uh, kohlbach leibler divergence, which is not really a distance, so that's in quotes, but it's a, it's a closeness measure for these two models. And this is the same if you want to think of it as kind of doing maximum likelihood in a Bayesian sense. There's this evidence lower bound um, where if I want to take the maximum likelihood, I'm maximizing a lower bound on that. So this is a very well understood, I shouldn't say well understood, it's a very widely used technique in the literature for doing approximate Bayesian inference. Um, it runs pretty quickly, it scales really well, it runs on these uh, machine learning platforms. So that's why we use it. So let me convince you that at least it'll do the trick in cases you care about. And address one parameter I told you about before, but not what we were doing with it. So these are some fake data. So I have three features that I made, and when they're in white, they're on, and when they're in black, they're off. So you know this feature is on and then goes off and kind of chatters a little bit and then stays on and goes off and comes back on again. So I made up some fake features and I made up some fake firing rate responses. The cells are pretty realistic. They fire at 30 hertz or under. Um, they, you know, the, the gain modulations are fairly modest. They're all like 20 or 30 percent. They're the kinds of modulations that you would see in prefrontal cortex. And then what I asked my model to do is infer what are the features that are latent in the world because my model doesn't see any of this. But I say find them for me. And what I said is I want five of them. So I asked the model to give me more features than existed in the real data. And the key thing here is understanding why this is okay to do. So I, I hope you can see that the three top features recovered by my model are exactly the same three features as in the data. That we can do. We can recover ground truth in a case where we know ground truth. What's interesting is what happens with these other features. So this one, the posterior is right at 50%, and it's just blah. And the reason is because the prior that I put on the system is to say there are not many features in the world. So if you don't have strong evidence, you should conclude that a feature doesn't exist. This is sort of chatter. You know, it really quickly jitters between 0 and 1 and kind of has this characteristic shape. And so in both of these cases, I can say, well, these are not real features. They stick out very clearly because I don't have enough evidence to conclude there's like signal in the world for me to see. So we can do this on synthetic data. So this is the easiest test. Now the fun part is what you can do on these real data from, from Leopold Lab. So these are pretty high signal to noise cells, so you'd hope to find something. So what I'm doing is we ask for 10 features. I'm kind of graying out the features that are very small so that the big ones here are at least, say, like 25% change in firing rate. These are reasonably good size effects. Monkey close-ups, full monkeys, body parts, um, natural ob uh, food, natural objects, man-made objects, natural scenes, you know, patterns. And so what you can see is, and I've ordered these features, feature zero turns on only for these monkey close-ups, plus this one you know, extra guy. Feature two is on for anything with a monkey face in it, and feature, uh, sorry, they start from zero, and feature two is on for anything with a monkey in it. So the weird thing is what we didn't get that we might have expected is, oh, I have a feature that is only for faces, I have a feature that's only for body parts, and when I combine them, I get the feature for the whole monkey. And it's really different. The way you should think about this is monkey close-ups are coded 111. Whole monkeys are coded 011. So it's much more like a bit code where we have some kind of compression. The important thing that matters here is that if I have 10 features and they're all binary, then I have two to the 10 possible codes. So it's a little bit better than having a linear set of features that all have to decouple from each other. They're allowed to be in or out. And then I get some little chatter down here, but you may or may not call those a pattern. Now what's fun here is this. This is the great thing about having statisticians work in your lab. So Shin, who was doing this work, um, had no neuroscience background. But she called me in one day and she said, hey, like, I, I started looking at some of the features that are kind of here that are really small, that we threw away because they're not that important. And like, I found this thing and I just wanted to see if like, I'm making this up. And so what I'm going to show you is, is a blow up of this region <coughs> for these photos and I'm going to fill in the features here that are missing. So again, these are my three features that were on really strongly. And she found these other patterns. So the ones that are coded 11101 are these guys. And the ones that are coded um, the opposite way are these guys. And she's like, it seems like the, the, this feature is like when the monkey is looking right at the, you know, right ahead. And this one is the monkey looking to the side. And like, that's weird. And I was like, well, you know, this is viewpoint tuning. We've known about this for like 25 or 30 years. And it's a, well, it's a well understood neurophysiology feature. And she discovered it by kind of looking at this. Now, I'd be crazy to tell you that this is proof positive that viewpoint tuning exists in these cells. But my argument to you is that if you didn't know it, 
this is the sort of thing you might design an experiment to go look for, right? So my, it, is, it is argument from, statistic, from neuroscience ignorance that you might, that an unbiased observer might have seen this and might have followed up on it. So that's there, and it's weak. There's very weak evidence for this, but it's the sort of thing that we would say, okay, like we would follow up on this. That would be interesting. So the way we would, we'd have to have data from them to train from. Um, I suspect what you would get is what these cells tend to do, which is they're really great for like bang on faces. But you know, the classic example of this is, if you give it a monkey, it'll fire. If you give it a toilet brush, it'll fire, right? You know, so they're, they're pretty broad, um, but they'll get good for conspecifics, but they'll fire for human faces too. All right, so what do we do here? The question that we were asking is, if you give me a bunch of spiking data, what are the features out in the world that actually drive firing of those cells? So if you don't know what the space is, if it is a social space or an olfactory space or something that doesn't have a clear metric on it, can we identify some features that we might want to test in future experiments that drive firing? And the answer is yes, and we're going to assign multiple tags to every feature that's out in the world, and they're just going to be binary. So the key thing, too, is that this is not the, even the full data set from Leopold Lab, they have much more data than what they gave us. It's like 50 cells in a couple of days. You don't need a next generation data set to make this work. Um, it runs in about an hour. Um, it's not the world's most efficient code, but it runs. Um, and the idea really is to suggest new experiments. This is, a, this is a hypothesis generation tool more than it is a hypothesis testing tool. I used 10 and I tried to clamp it down as much as I could. Did you pick 10? I just picked 10 because I assumed that, uh, no, so not 10 channels. The 10 is the number of features that we asked to get back. So what was your original? Uh, they had 50 cells, but they don't have to be simultaneously recorded. So you can do this on singly recorded cells, which is another advantage of it. Like, you'd do better if you took the correlations into account, but we don't in this model for, for various technical reasons that make it hard. So it'll work on single unit data that you record day to day. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. And then did you look at the, that gives you, the other matrix gives you a linear mapping between the 15 and the 10. Yes. And did you, is there anything? So there what we're assuming is we have this sort of hierarchical Bayesian thing where we assume that firing rates are distributed sort of normally around some population mean. The other thing I, I should have said is in that picture of effect sizes that I'm showing you, that's the population mean. So some cells fire much more strongly, and that's what you're seeing. I will tell you that if you actually look at standard, you know, single unit physiology experiments, even very good ones that say, oh, you know, region A has like a preponderance of cells that do this in region B, and you actually model them hierarchically and you look at the population means, they're almost always like bang on zero, right? And we're analyzing the guys in the tails. Um, and when you actually get a population shift away from zero, so I can tell you this because I've analyzed the data. So like Steve Chang's like monkey donation experiments. Um, ACC gyrus like really does the population is shifted away from zero. That's not just the tails. Like there's actually a shift when they get reward receipt in these social contexts. But other areas may or may not show that pattern. So I want to talk in um, the last bit of the talk here about this idea of linking um, strategic behavior to movement. Right. So the brain is an organism to produce movement. Most of our choices, um, most of our strategic behavior are exhibited through movement, and that is a link that we don't often model. So I want to talk a little bit about this link between movement and strategy. So this is work, um, most of it was done by um, Shari Kickball, who is now in computer science grad school, was a really awesome RA in my lab for a couple of years. Uh, Caroline Drucker was a grad student in Michael Platt's lab. JF was a postdoc with Michael, and then the data come from Michael's lab. So this is a little bit funny to get to this audience. You guys know this better than most people. But you know this is our model for strategic decision making um, in humans, right? So this is a complete information game where people take turns making moves, and it's very rational, it's very top-down, there are clearly defined strategic objectives. Um, this is another kind of decision that people make. This happens in real time. Both players are moving at the same time. They're balancing perceptual input and their strategic goals, and they have to move their bodies, and everything is happening very, very quickly. So the goal, and JF is the one who designed this task, was to get at something like this. And it was really to get at deception. I'm not going to talk about deception today. Um, I just want to talk about multiplayer strategic interactions that are happening in real time. So this is what the task looks like. 
Um, this is our animation, but the task looks like this. Um, <coughs> so one monkey is controlling this little puck. This is, JF is Canadian, so this is based on hockey. Um, one monkey is controlling the puck. He can actually back the puck up. There are other variants of this that people have run in my lab and others where the puck can't back up because monkeys are just greedy and they'll, they'll, like, they'll like, screw it, I'm going to lose, I'll go to the next trial. Humans will sit there and like back this thing up all day and the trial will never end. Um, the other player controls this sort of stick and can only go up and down. So this is the task. And like, as opposed to these match to sample things, it takes monkeys a year to learn. They learn this in two weeks. This is super easy to do. Okay, right. There are monkeys, there's a monkey attached to the blue dot, yep. a monkey attached to the blue blocker. Yes. Okay. And the blue dot must keep progressing forward? Not in this version. So in the version I'm going to tell you today, it's completely free in two dimensions. Okay. But they've run, Michael's got another version right now, and the human version, I'll show you the so little. monkey has how many degrees of freedom? Two. Monkey's free in two degrees. Um, the humans are only free in one. They can only go up or down, and they have a constant velocity. This is like trying to get rid of the ads on the New York Times. When the ads pop up, yep. and you try to go down to click it, yep. it, it runs away from it. <laughs> so, so this is the task. And I think the problems to this group are pretty clear, right? which is that every trial here is a different length. Um, there is no clear way to align these things. You can do it from trial start and trial end. And trust me, the, there was a lot of that that was tried at various points in this. You need to have some meaningful way to talk about the dynamics. So we spent a year on this, and that's what I'm going to show you. Um, so this is a selection of about 100 or 150 real trials from the last 10 sessions of very well-learned monkey behavior. Um, what I'm going to do by the end of this is I'm going to show you a model that will generate that, or at least complexity that approximates that. And in the process, we learn a little something about how they're behaving. All right. No. It's all constant velocity. So if the monkey lets go of the joystick, the puck stops. Okay. So the human version has some more complicated dynamics, but it really is, um, I'll show you the equation in a second, but essentially you can only get up to a maximum velocity and there is no acceleration. The velocity is purely dependent on where the joystick is. A very simple, very simple physics engine that goes into this. Um, so what do we want? Um, I don't care about the fact that the joystick only goes from minus one to one. We spent a lot of time in the lab dealing with the fact that that's like a censored statistical model. Maybe I wanted to move across screen and my joystick maxed out. We can handle that. Um, we can infer like how far you wanted to go even if you, you're at the top of the range. Um, I don't really care about the details of the motor execution, but I'm going to have to worry about them because that's actually what agents playing this game had to do. What I really care about is modeling the latent cognitive state and capturing the interaction between the two players. So I'm going to do this for a couple of slides because I need it to get to this. So that's my, that's my contract with you. So we modeled this by borrowing from the theory on control theory and time series modeling. And I'll make that explicit in a couple of slides. Using these sort of structured black box models. I'm going to make some assumptions. You could fit an off-the-shelf recurrent neural network to this data. It would do just fine. You wouldn't have learned much of anything, but you would have a fine model. So I'm not taking the easiest model or the most flexible model, I'm building one that has pieces that I, you know, as a researcher, have some opinion about and the literature has some opinion about. And I'm going to use some neural networks because, you know, that's a thing that people do now. Um, so I'm going to call these Ys uh, the X and Y position of the puck and the Y position of the goalie. So these are my states. Um, there are three variables that describe what's going on on screen. In reality, when I talk about my states, I'm actually adding the velocities in there too. That describes what's happening in the system. There are six variables, and when I give you those, you know what's happening on screen. Um, the control inputs, which I'm going to call U, uh, drive the change. So this is a little sigmoid function. It basically says if you have the joystick all the way down, you're stuck there, then it's linear, and then you're stuck at the top. And I'm going to feed this control input, and I'm going to express it with the joystick, and then I'm going to multiply that by a velocity, and there's an update step. So this is, this is all the physics in the game. In the human game, it's a little more complicated to make it more competitive and to keep the win rates around 50%. But for the monkeys, this is all that's going on. So my whole goal is to take these observed states up to time t, so I get a little bit of history there, and tell you what the monkey's control output is. So that's my model. I want to predict how far the monkey moves the joystick based on what's happening in the game. All right. So my assumption is that the mo monkey's using some kind of control model. And the simplest one in the literature that we could pull off the shelf are these proportional integral, proportional integral derivative models. They just have like three parameters. They're really simple. <coughs> but the notion is that I have some control model L. This is an error term. 
It's the difference between this goal G, which is where I want, say, the ball to be, or the puck, the puck or the bar, and this is where I am. So if my goal is to get to the bottom of the screen, and this is where I want the puck to be, and this is where I am, then I have a vector that's pointing between them, and that's this error term right here. So differences in being where you are and where you want to be are what drive control, feedback control in the system. Um, and then I have my previous control. This drives an update to that, and I get my new control with some noise. So really all I'm saying is um, I have a set point on my thermostat, and if I'm not at my set point, I have a control input to the joystick. So that's as, as much as you need to understand about that model. The fun thing is modeling the goals, right? So all I've done is take the behavior and shift it from the, the joystick variable to the variable of like, where is my goal? Where, I'm, where am I trying to get on screen? And as the game evolves and the players are in different places, where the player should be trying to get to should also evolve. So I have a model for how the goal is going to evolve. And the model is a physics-y model, so I'm going to say there is some, this is a normalization constant. Um, this is, again, just another constant in the model. What's really important is this energy term. So what I want you to think of is there is a kinetic energy piece, which essentially says the ball moves smoothly, the goal moves smoothly, I should say, and some piece here which depends on my current goal and where I am and where the other player is. So all that information. So we think of these goals, which are points in space, as moving around in this little energy landscape. They have to move smoothly, but this is kind of a potential energy well that draws the goals toward specific positions on the screen, depending on where the other players are. So these goals minimize an energy. Um, this kinetic piece favors smoothness. I'm just saying this again. This potential energy U is the thing that captures the interaction between the players. Um, this is a path integral model. Uh, for those of you who like the physics literature, um, it's also uh, a, a Gibbs distribution. So this U is a problem because I haven't told you what it looks like. If this U were quadratic, then this is quadratic and this is quadratic, which means this whole thing is Gaussian and I can solve the model really, really easily. Um, it's not, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat this E to the U as a mixture of normal distributions. And that mixture has a bunch of components. You can use a GAN. We used a GAN for this, but I'm just going to use a finite mixture of Gaussians. The only thing that matters here is that my mixture of Gaussians, which you should think of as places the goal wants to move to, the mean and the variance of that depend on the status of the game. So you might find out that there's a goal that basically just tracks. So if you're the goalie, and this is the puck, you should have like one of these little Gaussians right where the puck is. And you should track it. Your goal as the goalie should just be to track where the shooter is. So these are flexible. It's not just that I have these hot spots and they don't change during the game. They change flexibly with the game. All right, so our model looks like this. I'm going I'm to skip this, but this is essentially the block diagram of the model. And so we're going to use the same variational Bayes trick over and over again. Um, so we have an encoding model, which is the one I just told you about. And for the decoding model, we're just going to assume it's one of these flexible time series models. So this is, this is um, out of Liam Paninsky's lab. It's basically a Kalman filter if the system is linear. So this is kind of a more flexible version of a time series model that you would read about and learn about in a stats class. And this is the thing I just told you about, which is my scientific assumptions about how the data get generated. Um, again, this is just to tell you that there are a few other tricks that we use that are fairly common in the literature right now. Um, these are tricks so that we can use uh, packages like TensorFlow, which is Google's package for doing machine learning uh, in neural networks, um, essentially so that we can use gradient-based updating. So again, these are tricks of the trade. Um, you can look at them on the page. Edward is this really nice package for doing um, deep learning with probabilistic models that we've contributed to. This is my slide where I show you that the dotted lines lie on top of the solid lines, so we actually fit behavior, which is not super hard to do. Um, we can actually even fit the derivatives of behavior. It's so good. Um, but that's not hard. Our model has a lot of parameters. What you should really care about is the fact that this is fake data generated from the model. And it has its own little quirks. I'll show you in a second. It's not perfect, but it captures the sort of normal interplay that players might have. We are able, with not a hugely complex model, to build something that has goals that are sort of fairly realistic. This is what it actually looks like. So this is, again, my original 150 trials. This is the same number of trials generated from the model. So we're not perfect, right? Like I get a few too many up here, and this is a little too, too much, and there's some variability missing from here. But we capture all the basic qualitative features of the data. And we're able to do that in a way that what we get left over is this potential energy, which is this interaction between the players. And I'll talk to you a little bit in a few minutes about how we're going to harness that to kind of measure player interaction. 
So the generated trials work. So this is our sample trial because I'm going to show you some outputs we get from the model. So I'm just tracing. Um, this time here is compressing so that you can see that this guy goes down. So you have to read time is going back that way for the goalie. So this is a sample trial. What's fun is that I can also plot for you my open circle here is where the goal of the player is. And what's important is you can see that the goal change actually leads the ball change by a fair bit. We're able, based on later behavior, to sort of project where players are trying to get to, where their intentions are, somewhat before they've moved the joystick that much. I mean, it's not total mind reading, but we know what their tendencies are. So this is the kind of thing that we actually care about using as a regressor, is where did your intention move to before you started to move? This is the potential energy function. So this is the thing that's fun to look at for a few reasons. One is, there's more than one mode here. You're going to see this split into like a <coughs> set of hotspots. That set of hotspots is the variability across trials in what the player does at decision points. So we've got a probability distribution that essentially characterizes how variable their behavior is in any given moment based on where they are and where their opponent is. So we can plot that potential energy function for both players. And we can talk about things like, how variable is my strategy at a given game point? How flexible is it? So what do we do? We took this dynamic control task that lets us take motor behavior, which is sort of on a continuous basis instead of a discrete basis, and use that to look at sort of interactive decision making. Very fast decision making, not very ruminative decision making, but decisions nonetheless. We built a model that we had some strong opinions about. It wasn't just a black box model. And that let us get some pieces out that we think are going to be useful in looking at the brain data that goes with this. Um, and we have this value function that explains behavior in terms of goals. So let me just show you a couple of things about ongoing work in analyzing the neural data. So this is a small number of trajectories, and all the red dots are the spikes. Again, this is very hard to do in the normal way that we analyze things, because I don't have a good alignment point to like make my parastimulus time histogram here. And if you'll look, you can see there are not, it's not like you get spikes around the time that it bends. It's not that you get, you do get an uptick in spikes around the time they're going to reach a goal. But Nothing, when you make these plots, nothing just like hits you in the face. That, oh, this is clearly what these cells are doing. These are cells, by the way, in the dorsolateral and dorsomedial prefrontal cortex um, in a couple of rhesus macaques. So they're in areas that are responsible for decision making broadly defined. They're not the only areas, but that's where the cells are. The easy thing I can show you, because this is the sort of analysis that anybody would do, is that if you just take the end of the trial and you align to that, um, I'm going to look at big wins and close wins and losses. So a big win is any time uh, the ball and the bar are pretty far away, and the close win is any time uh, the ball is within a bar length of the goalie. So we're just going to break them out this way. And some huge number of cells actually are modulated by the outcome here, which is totally unsurprising. Right? Like you get a reward, you get firing in the area. That happens, it happens in visual cortex, for goodness sake. Um, what's kind of cool is that there are a really non-trivial number of cells that differentiate between how much you won by. And of course, that's important if you're thinking about training a system that's learning online, is you need some kind of differential response of how well you're doing. And that differential response is, again, you know, well above chance encoded in this area. Um, what's fun is that we're going to actually model the neural data as well, and then we're going to compare these. So we're using this model um, called LFADS. This is Chetan Pandranath, who's at um, Georgia Tech, and David Tassillo at Google. Um, this is their kind of model they've been working on over a number of years. The important thing for us is this model is going to take all the sessions of spiking data, um, where we're only recording a few cells at a time, and it's going to find a low dimensional representation of those data that's shared across days. So I'm going to trade in my you know, 300 single units for a bunch of factors that are underlying those units, and those factors exist every day on every trial. So it's a way of getting extra statistical power. And then the assumption is that you know, neuron 1 that I recorded here is some linear combination of these guys. Neuron 2 is some linear combination of these guys. So all I want to show you is that if I actually take my, my say I ask for 10 factors here, um, and I'm going to order these by what they, what they correlate with. So this is a sparse regression. So not only are these correlations, they're super robust against like, taking things out of the noise. So this is an elastic net regression, which some of you guys have used, I know. So essentially, how far you into the, are into the trial is a big predictor. That's not surprising. It's how close you are to reward. Um, where your goal is. So actually, how much you are, how quickly you're progressing and how much control you're exerting over how far into the trial you are is important. But also what's important is this entropy of the puck distribution. And you can see there's this one factor that loads on this pretty nicely. 
What's interesting about this is, I had somebody you know, give me a hard time about this and say, well, isn't this just the second moment, it's variability? That's fine. If, if your preferred interpretation is that it's just something other than the mean, that's cool. This only exists across trials, right? There, if you are doing one thing on one trial, there's no variability in what you're doing right now. So what this is saying is that DLPFC in this case, DMPFC are carrying some representation of either how difficult the decision is, because you know how variable your behavior would be across trials, or at least how variable you would be in that case. So I don't know exactly which of those interpretations to put on it, but the point is it's some representation of what you might have done under other circumstances. <coughs> All right, um, so these are just some intermediate things that we're playing with and looking at the neural data. Um, that you're getting more than reward out of this region. You're getting some kind of graded feedback response that would be really important for behavioral adjustment. Um, that you get these really obvious sort of progression toward outcome signals. Firing rates basically go up the further you get into the trial, plus you get to the reward. Not a big surprise. Um, but this notion that your single trial behavior reflects something about your strategy across multiple trials is pretty interesting. Because it says you're not simply sampling from a distribution, you're retaining some kind of notion of what that distribution is. So I'll just show you a couple of slides about things that we've got ongoing in the lab that are extensions of stuff, and we'll talk more about those things tomorrow. Um, this is a project uh, in collaboration with Scott Hutel's lab and Kelsey McDonald, who's a joint grad student with Scott and myself. Um, so they had, we're now up to almost 80 subjects who played this in the scanner. Their task is slightly different. Their x velocity is constant, and so they're only able to wiggle up and down. And so what happens is the obvious thing that happens here is there are a lot of like jutting lines here. And so what we've switched to doing in this case, and Kelsey was hoping to get this done for today, but it's not quite ready, is we just predict um, change points here. So we turn this into a prediction problem. We say, if I give you data from one subject, can you predict when they were going to change their behavior? Same kind of idea, except we're able to use these flexible Gaussian process classification models. We fit one model, by the way. The, all subjects are fit in one model with an extra little variable that says which subject it was. So even though everybody here only did you know, 200 trials, we're able to fit a really big complicated model because the model just includes a regressor that says which subject was doing this. And so we're able to kind of fit the space of all subjects combined and get individual level predictions. The other fun thing is all these people played against a human and a computer. And I can tell you that in the window when they see who that opponent is, you get all the normal uh, TPJ medial prefrontal activations. So they're at least sensitive to that. Um, and so we're working on doing things like characterizing strategies. So the last thing I'll, I'll tease that we don't have a good graph for yet. If you want to measure how sensitive the likelihood of change is to the other player's position and velocity. So I've got a function that essentially says, what's my likelihood of changing? And I take the gradient of that with respect to what the other player is doing. I have a metric that says, at any given point, how sensitive am I to small changes in the other player? What you can see as the trial goes on is that that ticks up and it'll go down and it'll tick up again at the end of the trial. And that's a different curve for every player and pretty consistently shows that they are more sensitive to the human than the computer. So we have a moment by moment regressor. Uh, we also have ECOG data of the same thing where we'll be looking at that. But we also can average that on a trial basis and on a subject basis. So that's work that's ongoing. <coughs> um, this is a, a different task. This is a uh, uh, prey pursuit task out of Ben Hayden's lab um, that we're collaborating on. This is a little prey item. This is the monkey chasing it. And the monkey's trying to capture. Um, the same model I showed you for predicting in the case of the monkeys where they were going to be and where their control was, that works pretty much out of the box with this task. Um, the important thing is not that there are versions where they catch the prey in the one item case, but there are cases of two items where they have to make a decision based on sunk cost, like when do I disengage and do a new thing. So we... Um, have some ongoing work to model the behavior with uh, two prey. There's a predator in some versions of this. Um, we're going to do things like suddenly change the value of one of these prey items and look at how that shifts decision behavior. Because what they've got in Ben's lab, they have three implanted floating arrays in uh, DLPFC, ACC, supplementary motor. Um, and so we want to look at changes in the network as you spur these kind of larger strategic changes. Um, I've already talked to people about this. We're collecting, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data out of the epilepsy monitoring unit. We're really interested in particularly streaming analyses of these behavior because we're saving all this data, but you know, it would be nice if we didn't have to wait weeks to figure out what was in it. Um, all right, so just to conclude, the, the 
the consensus that uh, the, the view that I've been coming to in the last several years is that I'm not going to solve the brain with modeling. But what I might be able to do is look at some data and suggest to you the better experiment to do next. Um, so that's what we do. And what we've generally been moving toward are building more flexible models that allow us to capture behavior variability across really complex situations, or at least complex by the standards of systems neuroscience, um, and to build our theories in kind of a data-driven way in close collaboration with people who collect those data, um, and really focus on moving, as a lot of people have, toward population dynamics and not single units and not tuning curves. So I'll, I'll thank the people who give us money. And um, so the first project was uh, Shin's work in my lab. Shark is primarily responsible for the second. Uh, Kelsey's uh, work, she's my grad student, I told you about it at the end. Um, Sam Yen is a really awesome stats uh, RA in my lab and uh, uh, some other folks who've been heavily involved in the project. <coughs> and I'm happy to take questions. So some of it is, is a matter of interpretation. So I would say the, the kind of zeroth level model that you make of this is, well, the monkey got the same amount of juice either way, so it shouldn't matter. But I think people very reasonably would say, like, well, of course it makes a difference because it's either more socially rewarding to beat the other monkey or because this is useful for updating your behavior. I don't know which of those things it is. I don't know if it's some other thing. Um, I suspect, like, with a lot of these things we look at, there are going to be, that kind of signal is going to be widespread through, if you, if you look in ACC and OFC, you're going to see related stuff. And, you know, with a lot of these tasks that, that activate the sort of canonical reward circuit, the problem is that everything seems to be active and it's very hard to tease apart, you know, functions of individual areas, right? And at the one hand, like, we, we write these papers and we, we argue that, but everyone knows their network level effects, right? These regions are not like tiny boxes that all do one thing and work in serial. They're working in parallel all the time. And so it's not surprising if they're highly interconnected that even though information may be flowing in one direction through that network, it's also flowing recurrently. So we weren't super surprised to see this. And, and I think nailing down the interpretation of why you get this extra modulation, whether that's social or whether it's just, you know, they, what, if they were playing against a computer, you might get the same thing, right? And there's nothing social going on there. So I'm a little bit open as to what that represents and, and how much of, I'm certainly not surprised by the finding, but I would think you would see similar things in other areas. All right. One could probably, cons well, it depends on what you mean. One could probably construct a model in which you could make this decision and the output was a single unit, right? The last layer of the neural network is a single unit. You can probably train that model. So there, there is a computational framework in which that is possible. That model is not robust to any cells dying. Um, that model is, doesn't contain any actual recurrence. So yes, I think it's mathematically possible, but it doesn't seem to be what happens, right? So if you if you lesion these areas, the animals are still probably going to play the task, right? They're not going to they're not going to completely catastrophically fail. So the the places where single unit stories have been really successful are places where, you know, there's a canonical microcircuit and we understand it really well, right? Um, 
I just don't know enough to say that we know that for you know these areas of cortex. That, that's not the level of granularity that people look at these tasks. Um, the other is where there is some super biologically important representation that you need, like those monkey face patches, right? That's now been replicated across a lot of monkeys. There are almost always three of them. They're like 90% cells that are super responsive to faces. That's like the cleanest example of a really high level feature selective cell, um, which clearly sits atop like a huge visual processing hierarchy. I just don't think after a lot of time spent looking and a lot of guessing about what the appropriate variables would be, we found that kind of thing in say anterior cingulate cortex, right? That like this is the thing that, like this is the right variable. I don't think I can argue that we have, that it doesn't exist and we just haven't found it. But we, I can say we haven't found it. What's the unfair question? Oh, well, I'm not, I'm just, I don't really answer. I'll answer it. I am going to take you back to the beginning of the yeah. talk where you're talking about how do we dig out factors, uh, yeah. features, let's call them. Um, that's in the absence of, <coughs> of an accounting of how, if you could dig out these features, you'd even compile the features back together to yeah. synthesize what the next system is. I was wondering. I spent a lot of time thinking. So you know this paper by Conrad Cording, right? Um, this this Jonas and Cording paper, Could Neuroscientists Understand a Computer? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's surprised it didn't work. Yeah. But I spent, a, this question I spent a lot of time thinking about exactly, right? So like if you know, because you know everything in that case, right? So you know, you know all the electrical signals in the system, and it's like, well, how do you reverse engineer assembly? And the answer is, Well, that's the thing. If you don't know that, though, right? If you don't have the theory that goes into it and you don't have the semantics, it's actually a very, very hard problem. So even for, let's say, a simpler system, right? These, if I give you an artificial neural network and I say, what does it do, right? It's a function. It has inputs and outputs. But you, there are some clever methods you can use to try to figure out what data set it's trained on a little bit. So if you take the last layer of it, if you know there's an output layer, you kind of wiggle it then you can figure out a little bit kind of what some of the principal components look like in the input layer. So if it's trained on faces, you can kind of get these ghost faces a little bit. But this is a problem that I think a lot of people are thinking about and nobody has a good answer to, right? Which is how do you infer teleology, for lack of a better word, from like... It's a bit of a far... Uh, it's, it's really too much to ask. I think if you probably looked at the Google uh, algorithm that they use and you didn't know it was playing Go, it might take you a long time to yeah. So I think the, the creatures we think we have achieved. So the other optimization. We know what they're trying. They're trying to stay alive. They're yeah. Trying to do things, so if you know. Things that they're trying to avoid or run for. If you know the optimization objective, then you have a leg up because you at least understand what the system is going to. The other is, you know, we spend a lot of time at the neural and the you know the behavioral psychology level studying learning, and if you know something about what the algorithm is, and you know what the endpoint is, then you also have a better fighting chance. So, so I guess I'm asking you. Right. Um, that's a useful description. Yeah. Like all of a sudden you're doing crazy things in your life. You're not scared to <coughs> run up to people that right. are threatening you with a weapon. And that's really bad thing to do. We might want to fix that. That's not really. Yeah. That's not the canonical algorithm. So the other thing is, and this is the other thing. So if you have that, yeah, because 
this is the other thing I thought about. <coughs> in a computer, and, and we know the brain doesn't do this at the strong level, but in the computer, all these sort of levels of analysis are decoupled. You don't need to know how assembler works to write high-level programming code. You don't need to know how the high-level programming code works to understand that like, if you're doing Super Mario on there or whatever. You have a finite state machine that controls that game world, and you don't have to know how that's implemented in code. So there are, in this case, there are levels of analysis that completely decouple from each other. The details don't matter. Well, you know, 100,000 dopaminergic cells are like the counterexample to that, right? Where it's a very small thing that couples all these levels. But to the degree that the nervous system doesn't catastrophically fail all the time, you might ask, in the case of the computer and the video game, can I infer an equivalent model to how that video game world works, like the game engine, which is not about how it's implemented in low-level hardware. That gives you the sort of behavioral level. And you say, can I do that? And then I can look at prodding the pieces of that. I may or may not have the right ones, but at least I can simulate. And so there's some hope that, that you kind of go both directions at once. It's in the middle that's hardest. At the level, like, say, a programming language or, you know, MAR level 2 or whatever you want to call it, right? If you're, if, you're at the, if you're at the synapse level, you can come up and coming from behavior in, I think, you're at least standing, you have one foot on level ground. Um, so there may be some halfway points that are useful if you can't get the whole thing at once. I would like to ask one more question. Are in a sense either computationally rendered or behaviorally rendered. And you use that in, this, in your dynamic this and yeah. your dynamic game description. Um, you use that to structure how you may look at brain effects. But, but none of it ever starts in the brain for what happens. Nobody who comes here and says, oh, look at what the brain does, look at the time scale. And yeah. The various interactions are these, these oddball structural motifs. And oh, that's a, an engine. I mean, are we just relegated to that? Only going that direction, sort of plopping around that way. Well, neurobiologists, for example, can they can get paid to go hunting the structure yeah. because there are things in the structure that we know are associated with right. pathological conditions or subsequent to injury and things like that. Those are important because of that. they don't have to have a thing connection to no. But, but I mean, again, I think as a as a theorist or a computational person, you, you need some kind of lever to move things. And for vision people, it was normative theories of vision. And for decision making, it's been normative theories of decision making. But behavior gives you some sense of how to define the problem. So if you're interested in algorithms and what algorithm some piece of wetware is solving, you might want to know what it's actually scoped to do. So you know, people have done a lot of like really interesting work with white noise, and then, you know, Jack Gallon and Bill Bialik and people walk around and they show natural images and the response is totally different, right? So the problem that you get, even in an artificial neural network, is if your input space is drastically different than, than the input space it was trained on, you essentially get undefined behavior. And so it's a little bit difficult. And you can learn things, but you tend to learn things at the gross statistical level. So you know, if you're looking at um, uh, cortical avalanches or all these other sorts of cool dynamical system things, uh, you can learn a lot of stuff but the input space is so big, you, you need to know sort of where the system is normally operating, or you're learning cool things about the system, but you may not be learning things that are relevant to human behavior. Yeah. 